Chat with Traders, episode 23. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. Hey there, what's up? Welcome back to episode number 23 of the Chat with Traders podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Firefield, and thanks so much for tuning in. Now this week, I had a very interesting discussion. I was fortunate enough to speak with David Bush, an extraordinary seasoned trader with 20 years experience in financial markets. David comes from a non-traditional background, and what I mean by this is he has no formal education in the field of finance. In fact, he's a music graduate and performed as a professional musician for many years. But as you're about to hear, David changed paths during his 20s to become a trader. After overcoming the initial challenges that all new market participants endure, David did well for himself as a discretionary trader for many years. But with an urge to optimize his trading approach, he gradually transitioned into a quantitative trader and went searching for new ways to exploit opportunities within the market. From there, David has gone on to take out the number one spot of Battlefin's Sharp Ratio Shootout, an international quantitative finance tournament with over 3,000 competitors. During our interview, David brings a really insightful take to topics such as the transition from discretionary to quantitative trading, how to eliminate a single point of failure by trading multiple systems, and how the Monte Carlo tool can teach you a lot about how robust your strategy really is. And I must give a special mention to Zach Hurwitz, who was the guest on episode 11 for making the intro to Dave. So thanks a lot, Zach. I appreciate it, man. All right, guys, I'm Aaron Firefield, host of Chat with Traders. Here is this week's guest, David Bush. Dave, what's up, man? How you going? Uh, Doing great. Good to speak with you, Aaron. Likewise. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to be speaking with you, the, uh, the Battlefin champion. Uh, a battlefield champion. <laughs> there are there are uh, there are a few at this point, but yeah, I was probably number four. That that might be right. I'm not sure about that, but uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, you know that's been a great relationship um, and uh, you know fun experience. Nice. What was the category you took out then? Uh, let's see. If I recollect correctly. Um, there were, uh, I think, in the email, there were there were thirty two hundred applicants from forty one countries, or a bit more than that, applicants uh, wise. But um, they they chose, I think, it was nine or ten uh, strategies in uh, in three different divisions. Uh, I couldn't speak to everything about the divisions, but uh, you know, one division had an audited track record. One. Uh, simply a live track record. One might have been just, you know, backtested results. And, you know, I had a live track record and, um, you know, verified or audited, uh, you know, results. So I was in that that so-called elite category. And, uh, you know, I think the strategies also, if I remember correctly, were across broad asset classes. So it was not like equities and were in one bucket and futures were in another and, and so on and so forth. I, I think I'm right about that. At any rate, um, you know, they had a proprietary formula and, um, you know, which took, uh, took volatility into account. So in other words, it wasn't just a return based type of um, formula, which, you know, is flawed in the sense of one can just juice a strategy for a tournament or something like that so that that i don't believe that was anyone's approach anyways but um you know that that was that was the the gist of it at a high level yeah very cool well done so let's let's get this started by giving us sort of a bit of an intro about yourself so take us back to where it all began for you and tell us how you discovered trading and what were you doing at the time yeah, that's that's a lot to talk about there, uh, and I'm sure everyone's story is 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 probably uh, different different in uh, in the details, but but similar in the sense of uh, um, a, a lot to talk about at the early stages. Uh, what I was doing at the time was I was a professional musician. I had been for uh, a number of years. I got started playing very early. 
uh, you know, in uh, grammar school, I guess. Uh, I took to it very, uh, very deeply. You know, after a couple of years, I wouldn't say I was bitten by music bug immediately, but after a couple of years, I started playing drum set. That's ultimately what I played professionally. And that uh, is just it just took over, uh, you know, and as I look back, you know, music and markets are, uh, are both pattern driven. They're both, uh, cyclical. Uh, one has to tune in, you know, you have to tune in as a musician to those around you. Um, literally if you're playing a pitch instrument, you know, to pitch, uh, obviously drums to, uh, to groove and tempo dynamic, you know, on and on. There are many layers uh, that are happening simultaneously. Markets are very similar and they both are, you know, they both have that behavioral component. You know, um, markets are, are certainly uh, not the same in terms of investor sentiment behavior from, you know, year to year, day to day, whatever. Um, so in, anyways, to answer your question about, you know, how we got into this, you know, I'm, I'm working essentially uh, you know, in the night, in the evenings, you know, and, and at night and occasionally, obviously rehearsing during the day. Uh, but day, days were, you know, largely free. And, you know, I, how, you know, I, I don't remember the exact initial trigger, but I believe it was watching, I believe I was at my father's house and he might've had CNBC on, you know, in the very early days, this would have been 1994, 19, uh, early 1995, but I, this was probably would have been 1994 before I started trading, which was in 95. And I remember probably on CNBC, possibly Bloomberg, seeing a piece or, uh, you know, some kind of interview and whoever was being interviewed talked about the market. He said, you know, valuation can change overnight. You know, I mean, yesterday's close can be dramatically different from tomorrow's open based on uh, just market crowd sentiment, you know, however you want to phrase it. And for whatever reason, that just fascinated me. And plus the ticker, <laughs> you know, the scrolling ticker, which is not something that I use, you know, at all, unless it's some kind of watch capacity, I, you know, which is uncommon for me. You know, that fascinated me. I, I knew that there were patterns in there. Obviously, you could just visually see some patterns. And then also, uh, you know, obviously, I knew there was opportunity in there, and you know, I was, uh, you know, I'm not shy, shy about saying after all my training, I was a very, very good musician. I played, you know, at a high level and so on. But uh, you know, it wasn't the most fruitful, um, you know, career uh, monetarily, uh, at least, you know, in in my years, you know, as a professional. So, um, you know, so I, there was a perfect opportunity to to look at something new and you know see if I was really interested and see if I could do it. Uh, you know, so that that was the genesis of the idea. You know, from there it was really uh, starting to pick out some books, uh, go to the bookstore. There were a lot of futures books at that time, which is interesting because there are not as many when I go to the bookstore now. Um, you know, physical bricks and mortar bookstore, but. There were just tons of uh, tons of you know Larry Williams books and and so forth, but uh, you know ultimately it was stock that I started trading and um, you know it was uh, actually um, you know picking up Investors Daily and seeing charts and going oh okay charts these are interesting you know and that led me into uh, uh, you know investigating you know what technical analysis was um, so that that really is. I uh, probably missed some part of your question there, Aaron, but you know that was really the very, you know, the very early stage. Yeah, that's excellent. So, I mean, I obviously wasn't trading around that point in time. So, I believe this was before electronic trading sort of really came in. So, talk to us about how you were maybe receiving data at the time and analyzing the market and sort of placing trades. I believe it sort of involved a fax machine of some sort. <laughs> well, right. Uh, and it's funny now to me, anyways. Uh, it it did. The fax machine was later on. That was an incredible uh, upgrade, actually. Uh, you know what it first began was um, was the newspaper, literally um, reading stock tables, uh, Barron's Investors Business Daily. Um, but I quickly learned through Investors Business Daily that they had a service at the time, and they probably still have it n now electronically, but. Back then, uh, to me, it was an amazing service because it was called Daily Graphs, and you could get this graph book sent 
uh, produced after Friday's close. Uh, so, you know, after 4 p.m. New York time, uh, probably to wait till that, you know, even after that to get official closes and so and so forth. But that would arrive at my house. And, you know, I lived in New York City for a long time, but my girlfriend and, you know, then girlfriend, now wife and I had moved up to uh, the Catskills. So we were uh, north of um, north of the city and, you know, kind of uh, remote in a sense. This chart book would show up on Saturday mornings um, with all the latest charts through Friday's close. And that was, you know, that was just awesome to me because, you know, the, the uh, FedEx or whatever it was, would, the truck would drive in and I'd, I'd get this chart book, I'd rip open the envelope. And, you know, I knew that that weekend and for the next week I'd be staring at that. You know, and I would mentally update things as to, you know, throughout the day or throughout the week, rather, you know, this this stock had gone up, this had gone down, whatever. But I mean, it was very crude. Uh, and yet um, it was uh, it was definitely formative. And my first trade was based off of, uh, you know, based off of what I knew to look for, which was limited, but uh, was based off of chart pattern. And um, and I think it was that very first trade. I'm I'm almost sure which was Zylogix X L G X. I'm I'm almost sure that without digging uh, through um, ancient trade confirms that was um, that was my first trade and and I got woken up. I didn't you know I didn't have data coming in. I did not have um, any kind of uh, you know active real time anything. Uh, so. I got woken up by my broker. Uh, and he was a full service broker, and it was probably I probably placed about two trades with him when I realized the cost of them, which was I think maybe a couple hundred bucks a trade back then. Uh, I realized that was insane. Um, but he woke me up one morning, actually, uh, pretty early before the market was opening, and he said, "Hey, uh, you know, it's Charlie. Uh, you making money in your sleep? You know and." I don't know whether I was asleep or whether I just was not quite uh, up and running, but I, I, I do remember answering the phone and listening to this and going, what the heck is he talking about? And that stock had been taken over, uh, you know, uh, two or three weeks after I had, I had placed a trade. So that was, in hindsight, probably like the worst thing that could that could happen to me because here you've got this this uh, process that looks incredibly easy, right? Well, you know, you just, you just get a chart book, you pick what you think is the best uh, it gets taken over for, you know, whatever percent gain it was, probably, you know, somewhere between 30, 40, 50, 60. I don't think it was as high as 60, but it was probably in the 40 or 50 percent gap up range, something like that. At any rate, um, you know, above my entry. And, uh, you know, that that was the first trade. And, you know, from there it was uh, it was a hard slog, you know, basically, uh, you know, speeding up my my path a little bit. You know, I did get uh, trading quotes. That was um, that was the beginning of some pain for me because while I was looking at charts initially, I got quotes, but the quotes didn't have charts, and the quotes came through cable. So you had to have a cable connection. They came into a little box that, God forbid, if it ever got unplugged, it took about two hours to reload that box, the OS. But anyways, uh, I, I got quotes. So now I had quotes, no charts, and I started, you know, tr trying to trade based on that. Um, you know, I had some success, some uh, obviously some losses, uh, but it was very. Um, I was, I was, as, as people will say when they're new at something powerful. You know, I was, I was most dangerous to myself. You know, I, I had a loaded weapon, and and uh, I, I was. Uh, uh, you know, constantly, you know, it, it was constantly pointed at, at myself, you know, um, I, I ultimately, um, placed a lot of trades, uh, went away to, uh, play music for a couple of weeks and the market had a very normal pullback. Uh, this was now in 1996. And, uh, I basically, um, you know, not watching charts, uh, just working off of quotes. You know, I I lost a lot of money. In fact, the the screen uh, every morning, uh, I would just look at the screen, and of course, you know, in a, in a pullback that's broad, you know, the screen is essentially red. There might be a few defensive names that are that are green, uh, you know, at the top if you have it sorted that way. But 
basically, you know, day after day, the market was just pulling back, pulling back broadly, everything highly correlated, my stocks all going down. And eventually, you know, I was getting very afraid. And you have to remember, I knew almost nothing. I was completely self-taught. I uh, had some success, but uh, this was my first real pain moment. And, you know, I said, if this happens, you know, if the market is down again tomorrow, I'm just, I'm going to sell it. I can't take it. And, uh, and I remember that that next day, uh, it was, it opened, you know, timidly, maybe a little bit higher. Uh, and then the market just sold off and it was an absolute knife twist, uh, bottom, you know, uh, I, I sold out of everything market reversed, uh, ended up positively. That was, you know, the bottom for probably months actually, you know, I mean, it was, it was the classic, um, uh, reactionary trader psychology. And, uh, that, that was when it was, that was my gut check moment where it was, okay, uh, you know, am I going to really do this? Am I am I serious about this? Because clearly, I'm not equipped to do this properly. And uh, you know, in terms of education, in terms of equipment, anything. And uh, you know, uh, I'm not one to give up easily. So I just buckled down, and that's when I started really reading. That's when I started. Uh, you know, I, I had an aha moment of uh, you know, every trade needs a plan. Every you know, risk needs to be defined. I mean, really, it's it's so basic. Uh, however, that was um, that was the beginning of really becoming a trader. Was was you know that first um, you know l- large painful loss, uh, you know account drawdown, and and uh, you know and and then going all right, what am I what am I going to do about this? Okay, so from that point, where were you learning from? Did you land a mentor, or did you continue to teach yourself, like through books and study, etc.? Yeah, up to that point, it had been exactly that. But then it comes the fax machine. You know, I, I, I started uh, subscribing to a couple of newsletters. Uh, this was, you know, again, this was still before email or, you know, at least any, uh, you know, widely spread email. I'm sure some governments were, were in some early, uh, uh, you know, had some early iterations and so forth. But, uh, you know, so I got a fax service. Uh, I got a fax machine. And I started subscribing to some fax services and they were just daily trading sheets. You know, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Here's my stop. Here's our target. You know, here's the kind of order. Very basic. Uh, so I, I subscribed to a couple of those or at least trialed them. I subscribed to one of them. And, you know, after a couple months, I called the guys up. I said, hey, you know, I'm not that far from you. Uh, can I come in? I'm a subscriber. Can I just see your operation? And, you know, they said, uh, all right, you know, come on in. And and it was a couple of guys with a secretary, uh, a money management business, um, but also that was just making a little, you know, small foray into education. And essentially it became an, a, uh, no one ever used the word internship, but it essentially became an internship where I, uh, was able to just, you know, help them around the, uh, uh around the office, do this and that odd, you know, job, whatever, and uh, meanwhile, I was often behind them, uh, listening to them talk about the markets, listening to them look for opportunity, uh, place trades, whatever. Uh, and I started to, obviously, I picked that up. Okay, excellent. So, give us a bit of an overview of sort of your trading approach and sort of the method that you've adapted today and sort of how you navigate the markets. Sure. Uh, it's certainly evolved. Um, you know, my... But early trading, once I had education, once I had really a couple mentors um, clarifying things for me, uh, showing me subtleties of patterns, showing me you know uh, how uh, how to get a deeper insight into a daily chart, for instance, by by looking at your day and and lowering risk and and so on. It really was discretionary technical trading, uh, trading primarily uh, on a swing time frame. Uh, so looking for you know that kind of two or three day to one or two week type of trades. Um, so working typically off uh, you know daily chart, but uh, looking at various time frames uh, and trading larger concentrated positions. Uh, you know they might be you know twenty, thirty, sometimes greater percent of the account. Um, you know which uh, is something I don't do anything resembling that now. 
Um, but at the time, you know, that, that is, that is how I, how I started, uh, you know, flash to the, you know, present day, which is 20 years later, um, not quite to the month, but in a few months it will be, um, you know, and I have a couple strategies, uh, you know, I still play some discretionary trades, certainly, but my, my primary activity is quantitative and I have a flagship strategy, uh, one that's been live for uh, over four years, you know, and has an extensive back test with, you know, survivorship bias free data and, and much more that I could speak to. But that is, um, you know, that's my primary uh, strategy. That is very similar in a sense to my early trading style, but it's quantified. All the positions are typically small, there are no concentrated positions. Um, you know, nothing, nothing ever over 10%. And, and, uh, in fact, the max is lower than that. Um, and the typical position is much lower than that. So it really, uh, you know, I see the evolution of my trading as, you know, managing a trade or a few trades at a time to managing strategies. Uh, you know, the strategy I just spoke to another strategy that is in the final stages of development is also quantitative, but it's very different. It's a machine learning based strategy. Uh, it will be up to, uh, you know, this is, remains to be seen, but somewhere between 30 and 50, most likely strategies all, or, or systems rather all running together as a meta system, you know, under one strategy. So, uh, that, that's yet another thing. And, and that'll be primarily intraday. Uh, but, you know, bottom line, now I'm really the manager of strategies. Uh, the trades themselves are less significant. Obviously, they're important that overall they work. But um, it's really making sure that the risk controls are in place and are working, um, that the live trading is um, is in line with the back test. Uh, there's lots of ways to back test poorly. So, you know, that's um, probably more than you asked for, Aaron, but that's, you know, the kind of the, the quick uh, evolution of my trading. Yeah, that's excellent. And I want to sort of get into that a little bit deeper. But before we do, um, if you were to give sort of a discretionary trader an overview of quantitative trading, how would you actually sort of explain this? Just if we can be clear on this before we sort of get too much deeper into it. Sure. Yeah, well, it's a great question. Um and deserves probably a, a compact, elegant answer. Um, you know, and let me try to do that in a second. Let me, this might be, this might be helpful because I was that discretionary trader and why did I get into quantitative trading? It's because I had this question, which was, I'm in a trade, right? And I've, I've, I've entered this trade as a discretionary trader, what does that mean? It means that uh, you know I'm using charts. I'm trading on principles, right? I'm trading uh, this trade because uh, you know volatility contracted. And there were narrow range bars. Uh, the trend was clear, whether up or down. Uh, on and on and on. Bunch of principles that you know formed uh, enough of a case. You know they built enough of a case to justify this trade. But now I'm in it. And I know my risk and so forth, and you know I'm hip to proper position sizing, of which there are many approaches. But what I never knew the answer to was, you know, what what's or what I was always asking was, what's the optimal exit? Like when when should I get out? You know, is it when I feel like getting out? You know, <laughs> or so there's so many behavioral biases that work against the discretionary trader or your average discretionary trader. You know, your your fantastic discretionary trader can overcome all or most of these biases of, of not selling too soon and not holding on to the loser, the disposition effect and all these kinds of things. Um, but bottom line, I just, I knew that there had to be, you know, based on my approach, if I made those, you know, conditions, if I made them rules, there must be an optimal exit. You know, even if the exit evolved later on uh, or was a little bit different in the past, Right at this moment, there probably was an optimal exit, and I didn't know it. So that was that was the the germ or the seed that was planted that uh, you know that I carried for a while without doing anything about it. Uh, but ultimately, you know, ultimately I did uh, you know make the move in, into finally um, 
getting over my fear of learning to code and and diving in. Um, so I certainly can you know speak to any of that more. But in terms of you know the benefits um, you know of of quantitative trading, uh, one can really um, aim to be optimal or at least near optimal. That's how I think of it. Uh, rather than than trading suboptimal. I mean, uh, what it, whatever area of business you look at, you know, or uh, you know, let, let's take um, you know, con, con, uh, conservation for example. Uh, you know, let, let's say a, you know a, a, a company is is trying to you know um, uh, shave uh, expenses and, and whatnot. You know, efficiency is really you know is is almost like the go to area. How can we be more efficient? Uh, you know, UPS drivers, uh, I, th- I think uh, somebody was telling me about a report where UPS um, was able through, you know, efficient uh, data analysis, shave something like 30 million miles off uh, their their driver's routes uh, in a recent year. I mean, don't quote me on that, you know, but that's that's the idea. So, you know, as a discretionary trader, you have to be left wondering, what could I be doing better? Uh, what's the optimal exit? Um, you know, gee, maybe, maybe this this pattern, this reversion pattern, this pullback would have been better entered, you know, a percent lower. Uh, you know, these are the kind of things that you're just never going to know as a discretionary trader, whereas a quanti- you know, quantitative trader, uh, you can know. Uh, and then you have to, of course, be sensitive to um, do you really believe in your in your your back test? Um, is it significant? Is it statistically significant? So that, you know. That's another area of there are a lot of pitfalls to become a quantitative trader if you don't do it right. Um, but um, you know that that's that's the the gist of it in my opinion. Okay, awesome. Thanks for for breaking that down, David. So, what were some of the first steps you actually took in transitioning to a systematic sort of slash quantitative trader? Right. the The first step I believe was having a huge list of things I wanted to test. So, um, you know, as an often pattern based trader, uh, there were a lot of patterns, whether it was, you know, a, you know, technical, uh, uh, you know, triangle pattern, you know, symmetrical or ascending or descending. Um, obviously I wanted to, uh, have conditions that surrounded that. So I just started, you know, obviously taking my discretionary approach and putting it into a list, which essentially were conditions. I mean, I don't think I would even would have called it that, when I was creating that list, but I put these conditions in a list and, um, you know, and then I, I found somebody who was willing to help me code up just kind of like a master template. And, uh, that was invaluable. Um, so that, that was really the, you know, the, the, the first foray was, was having somebody on the other side of the bridge uh, code this up for me, you know, at a pretty reasonable rate and, um, you know, and, and then give it back to me and, you know, with a, with a couple notes and then it was, I was off, you know, and it was just a matter of, um, you know, of, of starting to experiment. Um, and I certainly, um, did not have any great testing process at that point. Um, I was, uh, um, I was smart enough to use out of sample data. Uh, that's a, that's a big thing. So I don't want to go all into you know those you know, proper testing procedure, but um, you know that that's what I started to learn next. You know, apart from the coding, you know, I had a head start on the code itself, at least in that first program. But um, you know, fr- from there it was really well. You know, what's how many rules, uh, you know, how many data points do I, should I have? You know, uh, how many rules do I have? Do I have too many rules over too little data? You know, these kinds of things you start to learn. And, um, you know, I started to read about trend followers, even though I'm equities uh, and, uh, you know, one strategy is reversionary for the most part. Uh, another strategy is quite varied. Uh, but, uh, you know, futures trend followers are really some of the earliest systematic, programmatic, you know, quantitative traders. Um, and I started really reading about them and reading about the turtles and, uh, you know, uh, really just the history of that early generation of systematic traders, uh, many of whom, you know, could write their systems on the back of a napkin. 
you know, simple. Okay, sure. So I don't know if this sort of this question may be sort of beyond the depth of this interview, but you mentioned earlier that you were sort of looking for your optimal exit, right? So what sort of process did you actually go through to discover the sort of the most optimal position to place stops for your actual trading method? Right. Well, you know, it's funny. It's a great question. And uh, stops are one thing that, of course, as a discretionary trader trading larger concentrated positions, uh, I found um, were, were getting in the way of, of some of the best, uh, the best edges. I started to you know, create a bunch of edges, you know, a bunch of systems um, that, uh, you know, most of which I did not ultimately keep, uh, the best of which did end up in my, you know, in my meta system, which I still trade. Um, but, um, you know, but stops were, were something that when I traded a lot of positions with very small size, I got rid of because often the, uh, at least with my systems, the, the greatest probability of a reversion would happen essentially, um, you know, at, uh, at, at, at the stop, at the stop point. So that, that's something that, uh, you know, would be easier to, to see with, with some data, but in terms of, of how, how I determined the optimal exits, you know, in forgetting about stops for a moment, just simply, uh, let's say, uh, a limit exit or even, um, you know, in any ways you could think of, of a swing style exit, whether it was, you know, end days later and bars later, um, uh, various, uh, you know, various exit styles based on indicators, um, you know, on and on, uh, pattern-based uh, uh, exits, and and certainly I tested stop-based exit two trails and, and whatnot. But um, it, the, I would say, the process of of finding that optimal exit was was really just testing all of them, uh, and. You find out early on as you get into quantifying trading that and, and systems and edges and so forth that you, you, you absolutely need to be incredibly organized uh, with, with, your, with, your, with your record keeping uh, of results uh, because you, you don't want to just constantly change indicator values um, you know, and, and not keep track of, of what you're really learning. You're not going to learn enough as you combine con- multiple conditions together. If you don't understand each one separately and how it's starting to interrelate with the other, um, you know, you're, you're going to be lost you know, as you try to quantify. So um, it was really breaking down uh, entries with a dumb exit, a so-called, uh, you know, naive exit. I, I would, even in my code, I would, I would call it dumb exit. You know, I would comment out, you know, some, uh, some text that, that, you know, wouldn't be active code, but uh, that's what they were called, dumb exits. So I would trade, you know, I would, I would test entries over dumb exits. I would trade exits over uh, random entries, you know, ran, randomly generate an entry. Let's say, you know, um, day one uh, has a bar, uh, in that low value and high value, you know, the, the whole range of that bar, any, any point on that bar, for instance, could be, uh, could be an entry. And that, that's, that's a random entry test that, or one iteration of a random entry test. So just basically, uh, to be more simple in answering your question, you know, tra- testing things separately, keeping good records, and finding out, at least based on the ideas that I was testing, uh, what really was optimal. Uh, and it was typically a shorter hold time than I had anticipated. I, I had anticipated that um, actually with my approach, a longer hold time, uh, you know, just some number of days more, was probably going to be a boon. You know, it was going to be uh, superior. But actually a shorter time, a hold time, was, was typically superior um, you know, in, in my findings and, you know, in my approach. So it was, it was illuminating and it was very, uh, some cherished notions tested well, other cherished no- notions had to be, uh, tossed into the fire. Sure. Sure. That's really good, Dave. So now that you are sort of, you know, pretty much 100% a quantitative trader, what would you say this has allowed you to do that you couldn't do previously as a discretionary trader? Like, has it freed up sort of more time? Um, are there any sort of benefits in, in that regards? There are a lot of benefits. Uh, I would say, yeah, time was not the first one that came to mind, but that is one. Um, 
geometric um, geometric sizing. Um, you know, while I, as a discretionary trader, was familiar with position sizing and and had written, you know, had read rather, uh, you know, all the latest and greatest, uh, you know, research and and so forth, had built risk calcs and and so on. Um, I still did not feel like I was managing my capital um, as efficiently as I could. Whereas once I was quantitative, I I have you know a set of code for the signals. Uh, all aspects of the signals, uh, you know, which I could go into deeply, but there's another set of code that's just the position sizing and risk management controls. So really being able to control these and study them ahead of risking dollar one with this new approach was was fantastic. So I would say time is a benefit in the sense that, you know, I am not um, – you know, the discretionary traders, you know, have that that twofold job of, well, there's the during the daytime, you know, you're working during the daytime often, you know, even if you're not actively trading major decisions, you know, you're typically monitoring things, maybe looking for other things, uh, you know, and then the market's closing, your day begins all over again with looking for opportunities and, and watch lists and alarms and on and on and on. So that process um, is is incredibly streamlined now. Uh, where it's really literally, you know, collecting uh, more data and, and, you know, pressing some buttons and, uh, you know, and then I have a flat file I can upload uh, the next day um, or, or I can simply, uh, in another strategy, um, you know, simply deploy, uh, you know, it, it, uh, no, no order uploads necessary. It's, it's, um, uh, it's going to be interactive throughout the day. So, um, you know, I'd say time is a benefit. Another benefit is risk uh, in the sense of uh, being able to study all of these systems, um, you know, together. Uh, I, I do believe in multiple systems. Uh, you eliminate any single point of failure. Uh, that's that's crucial. Uh, so multiple systems together, uh, you know, some, some people will say that is the uh, you know that that is the one free lunch. You know, a form of diversification in the market. Um, that uh, I was going to say about that. Basically, the being able to study the interactions of those systems from a risk level. In other words, uh, and and you can do this as a as a discretionary trader as well. If you have enough historical trades, you can look at all your trades and you can input them into some Monte Carlo program. And essentially, Monte Carlo uh, is. Uh, going to give you alternate trade histories based on those trades, but randomizing them into a different order. And there are some versions of Monte Carlo where you can add substitutions uh, that are statistically similar, uh, you know, and there are all sorts of variations. But the bottom line is Monte Carlo analysis allows you to look at your strategy, whether it's real trades historically or uh, hypothetical trades, and scramble them all up, look at alternate trade histories and you see not one theoretical equity curve or one historical equity curve but you see um, many you, you can see you know 2000 2500 5000 10000 if you want to go just absolutely nuts with the monte carlo and you can learn a lot about your approach and you can learn that wow you know actually uh, let's say it's historical trades uh, i might have had a drawdown uh, this is just a hypothetical example you know i might have had a drawdown of you know, 15 percent, uh, you know, during the, uh, you know, last X number of years I was trading the strategy. Well, you know, you do Monte Carlo, you might realize that you have actually a, you know, you have a 95 percent confidence of um, of a 40 percent drawdown, you know, that you didn't know about because uh, a Monte Carlo analysis shows you that if your trades in the future are statistically similar to the trades in the past, then uh, you might be assuming more risk than you knew about. So that's that's just a beautiful thing about quantifying um, trading is that you can look at a risk level and you can say, okay, you know what what should my position sizing be? What should my approach be uh, if um, uh, you know if I want my uh, my max drawdown, my max expected drawdown to be no more than Let's say fifteen percent. You know, in all of those, uh, all of those trade histories, you know, one hundred percent confidence level, uh, or 
<clears throat> you know, or ni- 95% confidence level. So one, one in 20 years, uh, you know, uh, I might get a, um, uh, you know, a, a drawdown that bad or, or possibly worse. I mean, so uh, the benefits are so numerous. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I just, I love data. This is, this is already being called the decade of data and we're only halfway through it. You know, when people came up with that term a couple of years ago, at least I'm sure probably earlier than that, but, um, you know, this, this is an incredibly, I think this is the beginning. This is an incredibly fertile time in terms of, um, data markets, um, data streams that are becoming standardized, um, and, and usable as a trader. So uh, I, I'm really glad that, that I did make that switch. Uh, it's not that there's any flaw with discretionary trading. Uh, I will still, like I said, occasionally make a discretionary trade, uh, something that I don't have quantified perhaps, but I see the opportunity and it's very compelling and I like the risk. However, um, you know, I, there's just so much that I want to do, um, you know, in, in terms of quantification uh, with financial data and, you know, and sentiment data and so on. Yeah, there were so many good points that you brought up there, David. So that was really good. Um, obviously, a good system or a strategy is one that is robust. So how do you actually determine whether or not a strategy is robust? Right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great word. Um, I would say that statistical significance is, is really – the, the test that it that it must pass, um, you know, a high information ratio. You know, they're really they're really metrics. So uh, let me let me give an example of a couple. First of all, um, you know, there there are some trading systems that people have, or, or you know, systems where I've seen in in books, people write a, a book about trading systems. You know, and they'll include some systems, and and you know, maybe they you know in a couple. Cases they'll they'll have a system that they they put out there and it has, you know, it has a hundred trades historically, uh, you know, it has a number of rules, um, you know, and there's no mention of statistical significance. Um, that that's important. There needs to be, in any good system, in my opinion, um, a lot of degrees of freedom. So in other words, the number of data points, uh, number of trades. Um, Compared to the uh, the number of rules um, in a, embedded in the system, uh, all the conditions, all the decisions from entry to exit, and so on, um, there, ha- there 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 have to be mostly degrees of freedom. Uh, there cannot be too many rules. Uh, so a robust system will be statistically significant at a very high confidence inter- interval. Uh, you know, and there are programs that you know will enable you to. Uh, you know, to do that within uh, the software, or you can just do that within Excel. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, certainly, there's plenty of literature on that. Uh, you know, another um, another aspect to a good system, a robust system, is um, <clears throat> you know, there's so many. I, I would say ab- ability to uh, to translate to other tradables. So. Um, you know, it, it should work across not necessarily a lot of asset classes. I'm, I'm not one who says that you know this equity strategy should work on uh, you know on on energy futures. You know, because because there are a lot of structural differences, um, a lot of differences between uh, the business of money management of equities uh, and the institutional sponsorship uh, and demand that that can drive reversionary strategies and equities whereas that uh, doesn't exist in the same way in you know various commodity markets but but I but I do think let's say within equities um, a, a good system or a great system or robust system should work across uh, most equities of the same class you know most uh, you know mega caps uh, you know a strategy should should be um, significant across them. Uh, you know, another aspect which might be uh, too um, obscure, Aaron, so you can, you know, shut me up if you need to, but uh, survivor survivorship bias is something that the quantitative trader has to face. In other words, if you're developing an equity strategy across stocks, 
and you are testing across today's S&P 500 index components, you know, those 500 stocks that exist in the index today, uh, and thinking that historically that's what you would have been trading. That is just not even close to the case. Um, you know, where's Lehman Brothers? Well, it's not going to be in today's S&P 500. Uh, where's Enron? It's not there. Where's WorldCom? You know, so you have to know as an equities quant trader, where are the tickers that live in infamy? You know, th those are delisted. And so if you really want to, um, to go the extra mile, and in fact, there was a point, kind of another gut check point uh, when I was developing, uh, you know, one of my uh, flagship, my flagship strategy, one of my, my early, uh, you know, meta systems, where I said, you know, what would Steve Jobs do? <laughs> you know, like, would he, would he go, uh, yeah, you know, it's time to build a survivorship bias free database, you know, because, because that's going to give me more information. And the answer, you know, in my head anyways, was, well, of course he would, you know, he's, he's, he's a perfectionist. He's going to want to know the absolute best approach to, um, uh, you know, to building this, this product, this, this strategy, uh, and, uh, and therefore go the extra mile. And so, you know, that was one of those things I did, um, not from the very beginning, I developed a strategy and then I said, you know what, I don't believe it enough until I add in the blowups, you know, I add in the Enrons and the Worldcoms, uh, you know, or the shorts that might have been taken over, uh, acquired and gapped way up that aren't in the index anymore. So, you know, that's to me another real key for an equities trader um, to, uh, to consider and hopefully test across. Uh, are those delisted symbols. And I'll tell you, that's a real pain in the butt because um, you do, if you're really going to do it to the daily level uh, or even beyond, but certainly let's just say the daily level, uh, you you do need to know what are the constituents on any given day. You know, um, you know uh, April 3rd, uh, 1997, you know, uh, if that was a business day, you know, What's in the index that day? Well, it might not be the same the next day. So um, that that's quite a process to put something like that together. Um, but uh, but I think worth it. And uh, you know, yet yet another way to to ensure that you have a robust system. Yeah, again, that was a really good point you brought up there. I was actually going to ask you about survivorship bias. So yeah, that was that was good that you mentioned it. Um, have you ever come across a situation where? sort of trading a particular strategy live performed nothing like the results it produced when going through your back testing process? Um, you know, happily, the answer to that is, is mostly no. Uh, in fact, it's a more recent from phenomenon of, uh, of, of not having had that experience happily, uh, really having my, uh, you know, my performance live be what I expected um, in in the uh, you know from the back test. Uh, however, uh, when I have uh, altered execution, um, even after study, I have found that's an area where um, you know where the the live results have not um, have not you know emulated uh, the the back test. Uh, to the <clears throat> excuse me to the degree I like so so that's something that you know when when I experience that you know I have to take that offline revert back to you know the the original uh, you know proven uh, methodology you know for execution and then um, you know and then go to the woodshed on uh, on what I was experiencing with you know with the change so you know there there can be some surprises like that uh, I'm certainly not immune to them but happily. Uh, my, you know, I, I took really two years to develop my my strategy, which you know included um, you know many systems together, uh, the Stratversify strategy, and that um, when I rolled that out, you know, it was really after about a two year process. Um, you know, so so I uh, I tried to look at every, I tried to see every facet of that diamond, if you will. And, um, you know, once I rolled it out, I was, I was happy with, uh, you know, with how it, uh, how it performed, you know, it brings up the point though, of what, 
uh, how how does one measure you know performance uh, you know with a quantitative strategy and you know that that is something that you know traders will differ on uh, in terms of you know how um, you know how best to manage a strategy obviously depends on the strategy and the nature of the strategy um, and it could be as simple as having sliding time windows for something like winning percentage you know uh, if you see uh, that your winning percentage is, uh, you know, dramatically different by some standard deviation from your expected winning percentage over a certain number of trades within a certain time window. You know that could be something to examine. You know, so uh, having some kind of dashboard, some kind of uh, method at least for uh, checking your system health. Uh, you know, that that's important as a quantitative trader rather than assuming, well, you know, hey, it's it's worked, so it's always going to work. Yeah, yeah, too right. So that's that's really great. Um, another topic I'd like to bring up with you, and that is uh, fractal patterns. Now, I don't know too much about fractals, um, but I believe it's something that might be relevant to your trading. So would you be able to explain this a little bit, sort of about what this is and how it's relevant? Yeah, it's well, that's a huge that's a huge question. It's a fun question. Uh, I am no uh, fractal expert. You know, but I, I take inspiration uh, from you know from those who are are those experts. In fact, if, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from the late mathematician uh, Mandelbrot, who said that bottomless wonders spring from simple rules repeated without end. And you know, I can imagine. I don't know the, actually the context in which he he said, stated that, but I can imagine if it was a lecture that. You know, he was uh, displaying, uh, you know, his uh, one of his fractal sets, or uh, you know, looking at a, a coastline, you know, and expanding, and it, you, you know, you go closer in on the coastline, and it keeps getting longer. You cannot quite measure it because uh, it just keeps uh, growing, but nevertheless, the um, the patterns are are repeating almost on you know from any perspective, from any dimension. So certainly. In trading, whether one's a discretionary or quantitative trader, I mean, in fact, as a discretionary trader, you start to see that. You say, oh, well, look at this weekly pattern. Um, gosh, I've seen that on the daily charts before, you know, and then you look intraday and you say, well, gosh, here, here's that same pattern. You know, if I did not have, uh, you know, date levels at the bottom of my chart, if I did not uh, have, you know, year uh, markers separating, you know, uh, this year from that year on this large time frame, I might think this is an intraday chart. Um, you know, so there is a definite, widely recognized fractal nature to patterns, um, you know, in in markets, and uh, in terms of my own, uh, uh, you know, my own coding and so forth. That is something that is, you know, largely it's a great interest to me. Uh, lots of books on the subject. Uh, as you might tell, I, I, I love my trading books and I, I try to read far outside of just trading, uh, you know, which this would be one of those, one of those subjects that, that applies in so many fields, disciplines and, and so on. Um, but that's something that I, that I am, um, you know, it's kind of in, in, I wouldn't even call it development phase. It's more the, um, you know, wood woodshed type of phrase. That that's that's a that's an expression from my music days. You know, if you hear some you know great musician playing something and you go, wow, you know, I cannot do that. What is that? You go lock yourself in the woodshed. You know, and you you stay there until you figure it out, and then you you know you methodically work on it over time till you get it. So you know, fractals and incorporating. Uh, fractals beyond my conceptual understanding and, you know, certain aspects, which maybe they're already, you know, um, coded to some degree, uh, you know, that, that's something that's, uh, kind of in the woodshed. I, I, I do expect to, uh, you know, maybe have a production strategy that is, uh, largely based primarily on, on, you know, uh, some, some fractal formulas, uh, as, as the key driver. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a really good answer. So again, Dave, thanks very much. But um, now I couldn't have you on without asking you about um, a quote that Zach Hurwitz mentioned on episode 11, which he learned directly from you. And that was uh, the eagle, the donkey and the mouse or the concept of those three things. 
Right. So would you like to talk us through what this actually means and how you've used that to view trading? Well, that's funny. I, um, I love Zach and, and certainly, uh, respect, you know, respect his, uh, um, you know, his approach and, and, and unique ideas so much. Um, you know, in terms of that, that quote, it's funny, that is, I believe, from, you know, an older interview I did with, um, with the tab group, uh, Quant Forum. And, you know, uh, uh, I was probably speaking off the cuff, you know, I'll tell you how I relate to that, though, which is, um, certainly as, as a trader, uh, whether, uh, you know, or this could apply to anything, running a business. Um, but certainly as a trader, I think you have to be, you have to be all of these things, right? I mean, as a quantitative trader, for example, um, you know, you, you have to have the vision. Uh, you know, you have to have that 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 perspective, that that high, you know, eagle like um, vantage point uh, where you're looking at markets and you bring some kind of concept, uh, you know, to let's say your coding, um, and you know that that is. Uh, uh, you know, in one sense, um, being the eagle, you know, is is having that uh, that vision of you know what your strategy might look like, uh, or or some concepts you're 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 going to take uh, you know take take to the woodshed, so to speak, and and code up and and see if they're really viable. Um, you know, the mouse, you know, that the dollars in the details is an expression that. Uh, uh, I don't know if anyone else says, but I say it to myself all the all the time, you know, rather than the devils in the details, you know, as a trader, the dollars in the details, you know, um, you, you got to be a mouse. And I mean, you care as a quantitative trader anyways, about every uh, period, comma, semicolon, forward slash and so on that's in your code. It's all relevant. Um, and if it's not relevant, then then you're not a very elegant coder. But anyways, you know, so. You really do have to pay attention to the details. I, I would put, you know, uh, survivorship bias, obsession with with that and eliminating that from one's uh, back testing. I would put that in the mouse category, you know, in the dollars and the details uh, bucket because it really does uh, does matter, you know, what you're testing over. You know, these kind of obsession with details uh, also make you the donkey, you know, because – uh, it's it's a lot of grueling work. I mean, it's um, it's easy to test to back test poorly. Uh, you know, we could talk about that for an hour. Um, but you know, if if you want to test well, you really do have to uh, put in those hours that are you know mentally backbreaking hours, if I can you know use that phrase. And, uh, and, and that's where the donkey comes in. So, you know, uh, probably using it a little bit differently than I did the first time and probably differently than Zach put it. But, uh, you know, that, that's how I relate to, you know, to those roles. You know, there's, there's a lot of roles, whatever kind of trader you are. And, um, you know, it's a demanding, it's a demanding job, whether you're quant or whether you're discretionary. Yeah, no doubt. That's, that's really well said. So, let me ask you this. What would you say to someone who is perhaps interested in adapting a quantitative approach with their trading, but maybe has little to no knowledge of actually how to code? So, I mean, is it fair and for good reason that many traders may find this daunting? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly I found it daunting. Um, and I don't know if it would be easier today or not. I, you know, I... It, uh, I feel a little glib when I say I think it would be easier to cross that bridge today from a discretionary trader to a quantitative trader. Uh, and I think that is probably the case. There are so many, uh, even sites now, that are giving you the opportunity to, you know, uh, have access to some some very unique uh, approaches to to quantifying you know financial data. So I do think it is easier today, but nevertheless it is daunting because uh, it's it's not something uh, typically where you're going to dive in and you're just going to end up with um, with something fabulous uh, that that is you know you, just the op optimal expression of of everything you had hoped for you know as a as a trader. Um, but I would say that if you've traded. 
enough to have experienced pain uh, as well as some success. Uh, even if you are, uh, you know, alternating, you know, in, in those experiences and you're essentially break even, but you do recognize, um, you know, you have the ins and outs of the process of trading and so forth. You know, th- you could, uh, you probably have an advantage over somebody becoming a quant with no concept of what the market is like, um, how behavioral uh, it can be and how driven by emotion it can be. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but, um, I would say that it's always going to be daunting. However, the tools today, you know, they're, they're out there, uh, and you just have to, um, go in with it, uh, go into it with the attitude that this is going to be a process. This is not going to be something where, you know, in, in, in a month I have my strategy, you know, it, it's probably going to be some months of, of diving in. Uh, and last thing I'll say about that is, you know, I've spoken to some, um, or a, a specific example. I remember speaking to one uh, young kid, real bright, who had just graduated from a pretty significant uh, university uh, with a with a recognized, uh, you know, economics department, and he uh, had quantified uh, a strategy that um, that used. Uh, weekly data, and and had no account in its risk or for for anything that came between these these weekly data points. So you can imagine uh, what can happen in a week in let's say the equities market. Um, you know, a drop of of ten to twenty percent can happen inside that week uh, that doesn't even appear in the weekly data. Um, you know, if if those kinds of um, dislocations are okay with you, you think you can continue trading them out, you know, as they're happening, then then you know maybe that's for you. But um, but it does help to come to the uh, you know quantification process to the coding process with some idea of how markets work, some experiences, rather than in this kid's case, a uh, real bright guy, but. Um, you know, he, had, he hadn't experienced drawdown. He hadn't hadn't uh, seen um, you know his savings, his account, his hard earned money, whatever, uh, start to evaporate. Um, you know, uh, intraday, and that's you know that's as I'm sure you know, as any trader who's traded a number of trades knows, you know that's a formative experience. You know, it's a gut check moment, and your insides become. You know, it's it's like alchemy. Your insides, you know, become uh, made of different material after that happens. Uh, you know, at least uh, they're going to be if you're going to continue trading. <laughs> yeah, for sure, Dave. So this has been incredible. So again, thanks so much for coming on. Um, let's just go to a couple sort of shorter questions, and then we'll start to wrap things up. So from what you've seen. What would you say sort of causes the majority of traders to never reach a high level of success that they sort of generally intend on reaching when they set out into trading? Right. That's wow. That's <laughs> you have good questions there, not surprisingly. Uh, that is a great question. I, I would say that um, you know we all come, or I'll certainly speak for myself. I, I imagine many other people um, are like this. We come to the market with with these rose colored glasses, right? You know, uh, I I still remember looking at my father's TV and seeing the ticker tape, and this is like probably 21 years ago now, you know. And and I certainly went into markets thinking, wow, this there's so much opportunity. Uh, once you get you know thrown down a staircase or two, and you're hurting. Uh, you know, you realize, wow, you know, this risk part is pretty important. You know, I, that was unfun. I do not want to live through that kind of trade or that experience or that drawdown or whatever. Again, um, you know, so so your your lenses constantly change as you develop as a trader, and you know, some people are uh, are just going to say, you know, I just don't want to dig that deep. You know, uh, it's just. Uh, it, it's too challenging. Uh, I uh, I'm going to have to look at my psychology or you know my my own belief system. I'm going to have to uh, examine that. You know, come on, that that, uh, that that's that's nothing to do with trading. But of course, uh, it's everything to do with trading, especially as a, discre- as a discretionary trader, where you're more prone to succumbing to 
to biases and usually with larger positions. Uh, so, um, you know, I would say that it's it's a, just a, a matter of, of of digging deep. You know, I have met so many bright people. I work with some incredibly bright people, uh, and I like you know I believe in fun, just like systems can diversify um, one strategy. You know, by being uncorrelated, for example, and uh, you know, and and removing a single point of failure. I like surv- surrounding myself as much as possible with people who are brighter than me or think differently than me. And in this way, I'm getting exposed to, um, you know, to more uh, more ideas, um, more knowledge, uh, more perspectives. Um, and uh, my larger point with that is what I guess um, it, it's it's a matter of uh, you know uh, of of digging deep and and constantly exposing yourself to um, uh, new ways of thinking. Um, and, and I think that that's more than some people, you know, really, really are up for, uh, you know, to me that that's probably the, the number one reason, um, it's, it's overcoming a lot of biases and taking a hard look in the mirror. You know, it's, uh, it, it can, it can be rough in the early going, uh, and it can be rough later on, but it, you know, and just as a trader, you know, there are bad periods for any approach, trader strategy, what have you. Uh, but at that point, later on, you should be very well prepared for them, and you should know, especially as a quantitative quantitative trader. You know, is, am I in my risk parameters? Is this drawdown normal? Um, you know, on and on. So, uh, more 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 than you asked for, probably. But um, I, I would say the the digging deep, if I could put it in two words, that's what's required. Um, and you know, some people are are going to leave it at a certain level, and and um, and, and, and not, you know, push to be where maybe they could be. Sure, yeah, those are some really great points. So now, as you mentioned, you're a, you're a big fan of, of reading a good book. So are there sort of maybe one or two books you'd maybe suggest as a good read for upcoming traders? Maybe one that it, uh, perhaps it isn't even directly, you know, a typical sort of trading book. Right. Yeah, boy, that is so, um, that's so great. You know, I don't know if I can pick one. Let me just spit out, you know, a few. Um I thought that Fortune's Formula, it's not a trading book, but I, I found that to be fascinating and um, really helped drive me to uh, to want to quantify finally. So this is some years ago, but um, you know I found that to be excellent. Uh, I'm not a trend follower uh, in the classic sense of that first generation trend follower, systematic trader, um, the turtles and so on, but uh, I found that the book Trend Following uh, by Michael uh, Koval, you know, I found that to be uh, fantastic. Um, so many great anecdotes um, of the developers, you know, of the actual traders behind uh, behind the system, so to speak. Um, I thought that was a very well done book. I, I like that a lot. Um, there are so many. Um, you know, The Physics of Wall Street, that's a fantastic overview uh, for someone who just is interested in the you know evolution of you know of really quantification largely uh, and some of the different players from different fields who have um, who have come into the field uh, you know uh, of trading and and uh, and so on um, you know I could go on and on but uh, those come to mind um, off the top of my head Okay, sure. Yeah, those are excellent. So I'll be sure to put a link to those in the show notes. Um, all right, Dave, well, we should probably wrap this up. I mean, I'm sure I could keep going on and on, but um, your answers have been unreal. So thanks again for going into so much depth with all of your answers. It's been awesome. And I've no doubt listeners are going to take a lot away from this interview. Aaron, I, I sincerely appreciate it. It's great talking to you. Uh, you know, I hope we can do it again. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.